morning everyone today in my studio we're gonna paint a cat and I've chosen my cat as a model um, a lot of my students asks that I teach them how to paint their own pets so I thought this would be a good video to make for everyone at home um, so if you have a nice pet at home that you love you can take a photo print it in black and white you won't need the colors today so go right ahead and print it in black and white because we are going to give it some um, whimsical colors, not so realistic. So this is Tuco, he's our model. And the information we need out of the photo is really um, the difference between the light and dark areas. So I'm looking at his paw here that's really dark, his muzzle that's really light. Those are important bits of information we're going to use. Okay, for colors, I've got a pretty simple palette and I'm using colors I want to play with. So at home, use colors you want to play with. The only thing I recommend is that you're going to need throughout the process a dark color, a light color, a medium color. So you will need the white to lighten certain colors and you'll need a couple of dark base colors that you can really work from as a really dark starting point. So I've chosen turquoise because I love it. This color, which is a green gold, um, that's a hard color to make. So I bought, got that one right out of the tube. I got a violet, a red, and a yellow. So at home, if you want to work with turquoise, you can make it by using tallow green, I mean tallow blue, and a bit of yellow. And at green gold, if you want something close to that, um, you could use a little pile of white and add just a smidge of green in it and see if you're getting close. So we're going to start with our tools. So we've got a pencil, of course, two flat brushes that are about a quarter and a half an inch and what we call a liner brush. But really any brush that's kind of skinny and long will do the job. Okay, I'm gonna start with the drawing. So when you start a drawing like this, you wanna go for the basic information. Now, for the demonstration today, I'm using sort of a fat pencil. It's a 4B, so the higher the number, uh, the more intense or dark your pencil marks are gonna be. So at home, don't use such a fat pencil. I'm using that now so that you can see my lines through the process. So I'm gonna start with the basic shape of the head. So when you're working at home, make sure that you're not pressing too hard, <clears throat> sorry, too hard on your pencil. You want your, your marks to be kind of relaxed and easily forgettable if you don't like them. If you're going a bit too aggressive, they're gonna really be dominant in your on your surface and it'll be hard to get around them or forget them. So I have the shape of the head. Now I'm not being exact, exact. I'm just putting elements that I love, like the little paws here are really nice. I'm gonna give myself a center line, which is pretty important when you're drawing faces because you really want the elements of your face to sit in the center of the face. See how I'm starting the line of the eyes by just going on the edge of the nose, which is really there. If I look at my image, I have this line here on both sides that's on the side of the nose and around the eye. So see what I'm doing? When I'm happy with my lines, I just go a little darker with them. We don't need too much information, just the basics. Okay, that's probably enough for me to go with. So I'm gonna start painting. Now at home, if you're not done your drawing, pause the video 
and then uh, finish your drawing. But remember that you're gonna lose a lot of the precision as you work with the paint. So don't be too fussy about being exact. Okay, I'm gonna start with sort of a mid-range tone. Meaning that I'm going to go with an in-between color, something like this, which is not quite my darkest and not quite my lightest colors. So I'm going to start with turquoise. And no, I say it with a French accent, but I cannot resign myself to say it in English. It sounds so much better in, cell, in French. So I'm going with this sort of mid-tone color. It's still fairly dark, but it's not as dark as... Our darker series are going to be. And we'll go just a smidge lighter. What I'm trying to do right now is just give myself a starting point where I'm covering all these midtone areas, and it will give me enough information to work around it for the next colors. So I'll just go for it and I'll tuck. but you'll understand in a few minutes. I'm gonna go with a, another mid-tone that's just a bit lighter. So I'm gonna use this green. As you can see, this green is fairly transparent, so when you add just a little bit of white, it really lightens, lightens it up. If you're making your own version of that green at home, you probably won't have that issue of transparency. But here, we do have it. Okay, so I'm gonna go and cover areas which I feel are not 100% bright or not super bright, but are also not our darkest areas. I'm gonna put it in the ears, um, even though you've got this really nice little light fur, but we need something under that light fur. So this is what I'm putting in right now, just that under layer. I'm gonna do both ears. Sometimes when your paints are not dry, you're gonna get this nice little mixing of the two, which is totally fine. As a rule when you're painting, paint what you see. Um, a lot of my students still get completely lost in their painting because they forget to look at their model. So you have a model because it is the information that you need. The information you need is there. You have to look at it. So your eye should constantly go between your model and your painting and your model and your painting and it should do this back and forth 
gathering information, putting it down, gathering information, putting it down. If you don't keep an eye on your model, you will get lost. You're going to end up making up things as you go. And then you're going to wonder how come it really doesn't look like your model. Or sometimes it even just makes it look flat and you know, like the information makes no sense. So keep that in mind when you're working. You really want to follow your model. Okay, I'm going to do a dark color. This looks like a mess right now, but that's not going to last long. So I'm going to go for these really nice dark areas that I see here and there. And I'm going to make myself a color with the turquoise and the violet. They're actually very compatible colors. And they make just a delicious dark tone when you mix them together. Of course, that is if you have decent paints with um, good quality. And I know I'm going to repeat myself because I'm sure I've said that in other videos. If you're using cheap paint, you will get frustrated because the inexpensive brands don't have enough pigments in them. And they're, they make them bulkier by adding fillers that are very chalky. And they make, basically every time you try and mix a color, you end up with this grayish, brownish, dead color. And I'm pretty much guaranteed that if you got a really inexpensive brand of paint at home, you're gonna end up frustrated. Some people don't care, but a lot of my students really care about the colors. I do. I think colors are a big deal. I'm gonna add a little shadow under the chin, just cause I really want his chin to stand out. I want it to be kind of a main piece of information. change brush at this point. I know it still looks messy, but we will fix that in a minute. So we're going to go with a smaller brush, just because we'll have a little bit more control over the shape of our strokes. So I'm going to take everything I did and give it, give it a tidy up. So I'm going to sort of redefine the frontier, the frontiers of every color and make sure that they start and end where I want them to. I'm going to change color. I'm going to rework this turquoise here. I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm sort of with each color, I'm going all around the piece. You really want to do this. You don't want to focus intently on, let's say, one year, you know, one of these ears. Um, and then end up at the end realizing that you've put all that effort in that little area and it doesn't fit at all with the rest of your painting. Too big, too small, too detailed, um, just not compatible. 
So when you're doing a painting, you want to move all the way around. You don't want to just focus on one area intently for too long a period. Gonna make ourselves a nice light green that we'll use for areas like over here and in here and a little bit in here so we'll use that light green to create more contrast so when you're working on a painting um, very often I see my students really resisting the lightest air last lightest paints and the darkest paints when you absolutely need them. You need those really light contrasts to make the painting interesting. Sometimes you actually need to push the contrast way more than what you'd see in reality. Because if you don't, you end up with sort of a bit of a bland, flat subject that's not three-dimensional enough. I want to point something out while I'm in this area. Do you see that? line here where the cheekbone and the muzzle separate from the fur in the background here I'll move it down the cheekbone here muzzle and fur in the background that's important information so in this case i'm actually going to exaggerate the highlight that's down here so that his face can really separate from it Another thing I'm going to point out, um, I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm following the direction of the fur. So on an animal, it's important to pay attention to which way does the fur start and move away from your subject. So, you know, from the center outward on the body, it's towards the right. Top of the head, it actually goes up and turns. So that's kind of an important piece of information. If you want to give it the best chance at looking three-dimensional. Of course, there are instances like if your pet has really, really short fur, you might not see the direction. So in that case, you're gonna rely more on shadows and highlights. So again, you gotta make sure that you're being aggressive with those shadows and highlights. Be bold. Even though it's a little scary sometimes. I'm gonna make myself a really light, super light green for his muzzle. I really want his muzzle to be the thing that catches your eye when you look at him. He's got such a good looking little muzzle. So we're gonna go in there and work with this really light color. I'm going to move on to my really dark color that I'm, I've used down here and I'm going to use it to do these lines and then around the eyes. So I'm using this brush at home. If you don't feel safe with that brush because it's a bit too uncontrollable for you, you can go with a smaller brush. Just be careful that you're not tightening up. Often with a small brush, we tend to become overly detailed and overly focused on 
information that's really not gonna improve our painting that much. So if you're moving to a smaller brush, please just don't allow yourself to become so tight and controlled that you're gonna lose the looseness of the piece. I'm using my pinky to keep my hand really steady when I'm doing those lines. I put my pinky on the paper and it allows my hand to stay pretty stable. Now, kids at home, if you feel completely unstable with your paintbrush, you can wait for your paint to be dry and just use a marker. There's nothing wrong with cheating a little bit. It's not really cheating. There's not really any rules. I always find that these little bits of information complete the piece. They just make our feline look so much more feline. I'm going to put a color inside his eye. I'm going to use this one. So you might, actually, I'm going to make it a little bit more yellow. My cat's got pretty yellow eyes. I'm not sure at home what color your animal's eyes are. But you don't actually have to stick with it. You can go with a different color. It's nice when you paint because you can make all the decisions you want. And no one has anything to say about it. And if they try to, you just tell them, it's my painting. I'm doing what I want. This is not homework. I'm going to give him some pupils. Use this brush here, and then I'm going to show you how to make whiskers. Ta da! He's alive. Did you notice how pupils have a way of doing that? All of a sudden, they just bring your subject right to life. Very lucky to have that nice detail. Okay, now we're gonna use our liner brush, this little baby here. I'm gonna show you how to use that brush. That kind of goes every time you wanna make a line with sort of a gentle point at the end. Uh, you're gonna wanna follow those kind of rules. So you don't wanna do what I just did and grab a huge clump and go with that on your subject. That's not gonna look good at all. What you want to do, you want to bring water into your paint and then you want to roll your brush so that you can get rid of all the excess paint and all you're left with is back to that nice shape. I got paint on my hands, right? So when you're painting on a liner brush, the harder you press, the fatter the line. So if you want a skinny line, you've got to go get a very gentle pressure. Just basically Deposit the tip and pull. So we're going to do that a few times. You, because you don't have much paint on your brush, you kind of have to re-dip inside your little top pile of paint a few times. So I'm finding it much harder to pull towards the left because I'm right-handed. So I'm going to put my pinky again on the 
canvas. See how I'm making more of a mess there? Everybody's got a side where things comes easier than the other. That's pretty normal. So be, be uh, gentle with yourself. Don't be too hard. I'm going to put a few more highlights here. And then I'm going to give it a bit of a final touch, which is that little spot of light inside the eye. It makes it look wet. A lot prettier, isn't it? Okay, I kind of feel that that level of finish for what we're trying to accomplish today is okay. So I'm just going to go in there and I'm going to do the background. I'm going to go with a peachy color because uh, I think it's going to be a nice complement to the green and the turquoise. So complementary, complementary color to green is red. And I would think with turquoise, we're getting close to orange in terms of complementary. So we're going to go with that. So in order to make peach, you're going to need some white, some yellow, and a little bit of red. Be gentle with the red. Um, it's a really aggressive color, meaning that when you mix it, when you put a little bit into another color, it changes it really, really fast. Okay, I'm gonna start on this side. I'm using this opportunity to tighten up the shape of my cat, like make sure that my outer shape is the way I want it. It's very possible if you're working too fast or if you don't have much control of your brush, that you'll go too far into the shape of your cat. So you can, if you want, use a smaller brush. Like do, do the bulk of it with your big brush and go sort of around. And then use a smaller brush for these areas that are closer. Because you'll have a little bit more control that way. But you've got your colors on your palette. So if you make a little mess up or if you have a little accident, you can just cover it up. I'm not being too careful. Did you see how I had a little bit of turquoise in there? I'm not going to worry too much about that. I'm also not worrying too much about matching my color exactly. But when they're side by side, and they're still wet like they are now, I take the time to go back and forth between the two. Uh, because this really allows them to live side by side without being aggressive with each other. You don't want that really harsh line between your background colors. I am going to go a lot lighter for this area. I feel like because we're a bit light here, I want my cat to stand out. So I'm using again the line part of my brush to really dig in there and maintain that fur effect on the edge of the shape. So I can make sure that I'm not going like I did here, where I create just a straight line. I really want that furry effect to be maintained. So that's why I'm going in there with just the tip of my brush using the straight edge of it. We're almost done. That was fast, wasn't it? Now, at home, you're probably not working as fast as I am. That's okay. I've got lots of years of experience, so it would be kind of sad for me if you could work as fast as I do. It's funny, as the painting goes along, my voice just goes down. I think I get just too relaxed. So I have to constantly remind myself to speak loud enough so that you can hear me. I have a good microphone, but I just get too relaxed when I paint. I'm really hoping, I'm making these videos because I'm hoping the same will happen to you. I'm hoping that you're just going to irresistibly become super zen as you paint. Because life carries enough stress, this should be fun. 
it should be more peaceful. I'm going darker, as you can see, under my cat. I want to install him so he's not floating in the air. A good way to do that is to create the, even if you're not putting like a real shadow, create at least the impression of a shadow so that he feels connected to the ground. I'm gonna be a little bold here and I'm gonna grab right out red and bring it in here so don't be too organized about this there's no rule I just really want this corner here to be my darkest most grounded area I think we're pretty much done. I'm just gonna make the brush strokes a little more interesting in here. And I'm gonna do, so at the very end like this, it's a good time to look at your piece and ask yourself, is there anything that I did that I don't like? And take five or six minutes just to do a little tidy up. And I want to remind you, while we're in that stage, give yourself the chance to finish your paintings. The important work, or the work that really makes your piece looks finished, happens in the last 20%. So if you give up halfway through, you're not giving yourself that chance to see your work finished. And with the impact that it should be having with that last little bit of work that you had at the end. Okay, he's done. We're gonna let him dry. He's all dry. So we're gonna remove the tape. I'm gonna move this to the side here. We're gonna remove the tape and then we're gonna do a little enhancement, enhancement with markers. So again, when you're removing your tape, be gentle. If you've used a, like a printer paper kind of paper, you're gonna need to be very gentle so it doesn't rip. So hold your paper down with one hand and pull away from your paper. Okay. It's nice to have a little bit of a border on the edge right here. That works pretty well. So I'm gonna do a little decoration. I'm gonna use one of those Sharpie. They are, those ones are acrylic Sharpies but if you have permanent markers at home, they would do just as well. And this one, oh, that one's a little dry. So we'll just give it a minute to come back to life by pressing. Let's see if I can get a few nice circles. So all I wanna do is give it a bit more of a whimsical feel by adding, adding these little circles. I'm trying to, real hard to stay within the limits of my painting. I don't want to be too organized and too literal. So I'm really just trying to spread them in a pleasing way. I'm going to change color. I'm going to go with this yellow. It's really nice just because I want it to be a bit different when I move on to what I would consider maybe the wall. 
for the sky. Is our creation for today thank you so much for joining me in my studio if you have requests at home if you're at home with the kids or just yourself and um, you have ideas of things you would like to paint but don't know how send me a little note go on my website send me an email um, and I'll see if I can make you a little bit of a video for that hopefully it will be helpful